Hi, and welcome to another episode of About the Authors TV. I'm your host, Jake Brown. One of Time Magazine's 100 Most Interesting People of the Year, pastor and best-selling author Rob Bell, celebrated for life-changing books like Love Wins, What We Talk About When We Talk About God, How to Be Here, Everything is Spiritual and What is the Bible, and host of the Robcast podcast, joins us today to talk about it all. Rob, welcome to the show. How prevalent were books growing up around your house? And were you like a lot of us guys reading The Hardy Boys early on? What a great question. And it's funny that you mentioned The Hardy Boys. Um, yeah, so my, I, I would say that my parents were intellectually restless. So reading, discussing, knocking around ideas, having people for dinner and having discussions about with depth were all so like I, I don't think I ever saw my dad turn a television on. Um, so, and I, but I do remember him cutting out an article from the wall street journal when I was whatever 15 and being like, Hey, the, it, you might find this really interesting. Or, uh, there was a book, the voyages of Joshua Slocum, this man in 1895 who sailed around the world alone. They still don't quite know exactly how he did it. Um, I remember my dad showing me, handing me C.S. Lewis and saying like, this guy writes, it's, it's like fiction, but you'll see there's all these other things going on just below the surface. My mom was an English teacher, got her, got her master's in English from UCLA when she was 21. <laughs> so there was definitely a love of writing, uh, being able to articulate an idea. Our dinner table was like, man, everybody had something to say. <laughs> so yeah, yeah, that's I, I grew up in that environment where you're you're always exploring and you're passing books around to each other. And that's it was always just sort of a very normal way um, of being like, how else would it be? Yeah. I assume you grew up like so many millions of American kids who went to church every Sunday with their family. Yeah, yeah. My parents would take us. My parents were people of faith and they would take us to church and. I remember distinctly finding the Jesus stories really, really interesting and captivating. Like how every time there was an in-group that had pushed somebody to the edges, Jesus always moved to the person on the edges. I found that movement really interesting. That when he's asked a question, most of the time he responds with a question. So it's the opposite of brainwashing. He's like, what do you think? How do you interpret it? What do you think it means? Um, and the fact that these stories were generally had an element of absurdity to them. So this son blows all the family inheritance and then comes back and the father welcomes him back. Like there was some, it was like, a, it was a story, but it was slightly off. It was just like a little weird. And that there was some truth lurking in the story that wasn't directly stated. It was almost like it found you. Um, these were all things at a young age that I was like, this whole religious system that's built up here isn't actually reflective of this stuff. Cause these stories are way, these stories are more talking heads. This is more David Byrne. <laughs> this is more Jimi Hendrix right here. These stories, you know what I mean? Uh, this is more Bjork. This is like, he's doing something very clever here and very powerful. Um, and this whole system that's built up is, is much more conventional and it sort of demands a level of like, I don't even know what you would call it, conformity. So it's like I felt like these stories were in on something and I could hear it. It was like I lived in a world that was ranked. There was a hierarchy everywhere you looked. People with money, people who had less money, people who were more popular, who were less popular. And these Jesus stories kept insisting that the way the system does its ranking, there are other ways to rank things. The first will be last. You really, really want to be powerful? Use whatever power you have to help the vulnerable. Um, I don't know if I would have articulated that you know, as a high school student. I just knew that there was something upside down about it that called to me it was like there is something else there's a world within this world and your part 
of a world that tells you these are the rules, here's how it works, here are the winners, here are the losers. There are other ways to see this. And that's why Rage Against the Machine, that's why those Fugazi, that's why those artists, Basquiat spoke to me is, yeah, there was like, you don't have to buy the party line. <laughs> What about public speaking? Did you find you were an extrovert as a kid and that that came natural to you? I do remember speaking and I remember going and hearing my dad. My dad was asked to speak. So I remember walk, go, I would go to my dad with my dad when he would speak places. And I remember like public speaking class. And then when there was projects in class, I remember being like, oh, uh, yeah, this, uh, this is, yeah, I, this is not a problem. I like doing this. And then in college, when my friend started a band and I talked my way into the lead singer role, I was like, Oh, I just, I know how to do this. This was the tell first thing about, I could do. Yeah, there was always better. That. There was always better athletes. There were always better students. I always got the 89.4 and the teacher rounded down to a B plus, not up to an A minus. Like there was just always somebody better. And when that band started and I was the front man and I could just make the rules, <laughs> I seriously, some deep sense of, I knew how, like this, I could, this was, I like this, this is good, I can do this. Before you found your home on stage as a pastor, you first found your confidence performing for an audience as part of the college band Ton Bundle. Tell us a bit about the musical side of your imagination. My Aunt Jane was an artist, and I think 1983 for Christmas, she gave me the police synchronicity. And I remember my dad had this brown leather chair in the den in our farm host, farmhouse on Dobie Road. And I'm 13 living in a suburb in the Midwest and it's cold and snowy. Then I remember putting that thing on my Walkman and being like, what the, it was like, like a portal, like King of pain. What, what, where, what planet? Uh, I know many people had that experience with Pink Floyd, David Bowie. Like you go down the list of artists who as a kid, the cure, you just went somewhere. You know what I mean? Like I lived in a world of like basketball practice and math class. And it was a, it was a world that had a very strong code of like what you wear, how you behave, who's in, who's out, who's cool, who's not. And um, the police synchronicity men at work, who can it be now? I remember a kid named Andy with the flat top, that record, that tape, it was always tapes and cassettes just completely blasted me into the stratosphere. So that's probably my first memory or sitting there at the piano next to the stairs in the farmhouse on Dobie Road, trying to pick out where the streets have no name on piano, trying to figure it out. Like just what is going on with these notes? Why are they so captivating to me? I would also say, remember how you saw the video on MTV, maybe an interview with the band, maybe something in Rolling Stone. Then you had the record and the liner notes. But otherwise, you didn't have anything. You didn't have behind the scenes. You didn't have shots on the tour bus. You didn't have a vlog a day that told you. So there was a mythic quality to it where you filled in the spaces with your imagination. Um, and now when the shirt they're wearing in the video, you can quickly Google where they bought the shirt and how much it cost. And you can find it in two different colors if you need to. Like you can break the whole, it can be broken down into its parts. But at the time, Bruce Springsteen walked in to, was it Columbia and handed them a cassette and it was the Nebraska album. You had that story. You had the Nebraska cassette that was sparse and Mr. State Trooper and that's all you had. You know what I mean? So those like in your psyche, this, these people and what they were saying just became like massive and inspiring it, and mythic and transcendent. Uh, you didn't know who they were dating or what restaurant in West Hollywood they ate at last night or what shoes they're collecting in their closet. Like you didn't know any of this. You just knew they landed here. They parked the spaceship behind a tree and came out with a guitar. And this is what they gave you. My one son tells me 
it, you can still find it on the internet, which makes me laugh really hard because that, that album was like 1990 or something, 91. But no, the, your question, so when I was teaching water skiing in Northern Wisconsin the summer after college and I volunteered, there was like this like religious, like a chapel service for people who worked at this camp. And I volunteered one week to give the sermon. When I got up to give the sermon, I was like, oh, this is an art form. Cause I'd only, I ever, I, my only mem my, my dominant memories of sermons where they were boring. It was like somebody just droning on and when, when can we go to lunch? But somehow it, it suddenly to me was like a, like a radical revolutionary art form. It was like, subver it was like a, there was a band way to do this, which was gather people and talk about what we all want to talk about anyway. And everybody wants to be inspired and everybody wants hope and everybody wants help in living a better life it was like all of the associations with the word just weren't there for me and i thought about martin luther king i have a dream that was a sermon like that was a moment and you were there or you weren't you didn't really critique it it was more like you were caught up in it so that's what happened is is it was like i know everybody thinks this is lame but i don't i think it could actually be awesome <laughs> i mean it was really that powerful like I'm going to try, I'm going to reclaim this as something really, I'm compelled by it. I'm going to give myself to this, see what happens. Well, your way of pastoring and teaching the Bible has definitely had a bit of a punk rock style to it over the past 30 years. I mean, I realize now, even talking to you now, like the fact that people just had these views that were like, no, 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 there are other ways to see this. It was almost like a conspiracy. Like how did something that's, historically been so powerful and disruptive becomes so lame so yeah i guess that's what i'm gonna do i'm gonna i'm gonna let people know that you can see it some other way that path actually began for you with a degree in divinity from fuller theological college and i understand ed dobson was an early mentor of sorts to you the beauty of studying theology is you find out that really, really intelligent people have reflected on the big questions. And there's a rich historic stream of wisdom. So the human heart, how do you forgive people when you've been wronged? Uh, what does a new humanity look like that isn't stuck in the same old cycles of violence? Um, even, even in reading the Bible, and discovering its original context and the Hebrew and the Greek. Oh, these people were asking the questions that we're asking to this day. And the power of an ancient text is you read the text and it reads you. So you're learning that you're not alone, that other people have asked questions about economics and political structures and what happens when a society when the power structures do not tilt in favor of the vulnerable? What happens when more and more wealth is located in fewer and fewer hands? Um, so yeah, that was, it's giving you like, like almost like showing you the playing field. Oh, this is how people have wrestled with these issues. Um, how do you leave in such a way that actually serves people and empowers them and not just lead for your own empire building? Yeah, so that, that, that was really, really helpful. And then I had visited my parents one time. They were living in Grand Rapids, Michigan. I was living in California and they had told me about this preacher that they had gone, been going to hear. And so I went to hear him because they had said, you're going to love this guy. And this was this man named Ed Dobson. And I'm telling you, Jake, it was like, I just never, I was like thousands of people would come to hear him preach. I don't know if I've ever, I'd ever seen something like that. And he was like, he was like a master communicator. So it was just that thing when you're 20, 21, and you see somebody doing something and it looks like a giant magic trick. Like, how did they do that? And yet something within you wants to do that. <laughs> and so I went afterwards to try and find him thinking there's no way that guy's talked to thousands of people and you can just go talk to him but i found him like in a back room in a back hallway of this church and i had a cassette 
a tum bundle cassette on me, which I gave him. <laughs> and then he contacted me. My parents were like, what? Um, and we became friends. He became like a mentor. So that's how the, the first gig worked is he said, how about when you're done with seminary, you come and I'll, you can follow me around. I'll do my best to train you. Wow, that invitation must have been a hard one to resist. Once again, this is the early 90s. I mean, this is 1991. Uh, yeah, and imagine like this person who does this thing that you're like, you, it's like you can't quite, it just blows your mind what he does. And then he says, because I had thought, I should just go ask him if I could take out the trash and just follow him around. I'll get a, like, I'll find some other job just to fuck, because I need to watch somebody do this. And then he said, why don't you come be like an intern? And, and so he, he, like he made an, they, there was an office next to his office. So I got to like watch this guy like up close and he, he let me come to all these or meetings. And I, and like, seriously, he would, he, he would go to the hospital because a young fam, you know, a young couple, their baby was born and they didn't know if the baby was going to make it. And then he'd say, let's go. And I'd get in the car and, and we'd go down to the hospital and sit with this young couple. So it was like funerals and crisis calls of somebody who's thinking about killing themselves. And then sermons where we were trying to teach people like, well, how do you, what does, what does life, what does vitality, what does it look like? I would notice sometimes there wasn't anything to say. So uh, there was a woman whose husband died at a very young age and she was just wrecked. I mean, it was so heartbreaking. And I noticed when he was with her, he would give her a hug. Um, but he didn't need, he didn't have any compulsion to explain which can't, that which can't be explained. <laughs> so I noticed first off that the real masters with words also knew when words were going to fail you and they'd made peace with that. I also noticed he, he had like, it's almost like a musical sense of story. He never, if you could use a bigger word or a shorter word, he'd use the shorter word. He was not trying to impress people with what he knew. He would find the story in whatever it is. And he would break things down for people and say, I have, he speaks slowly. I have three thoughts about this. Number one, like he, he was always breaking things down into a structure um, that almost like honored people with, I'm not just up here talking, like I've actually worked on this. There's actually, there's actually a flow here. There's an A, B, and a C. Um, and even to this day in my work, when people are like, it feels like you're just talking, but then all of a sudden at the hour mark, I realize that all of this is related to all of this. Yeah, yeah, it's because there's, there's a structure. You might not see it at first. I might not be as obvious as I'm going to say four things. Here are the four things. You know what I mean? But I might appear as though I'm all over the place, just riffing on this and riffing out that stream of consciousness. But like my newest book, Everything is Spiritual, people are like, it feels like you're just riffing, but suddenly I would realize that the last 40 pages were all a tightly wound had a point and they were actually looping back on purpose. And they're like, Oh, they're actually, they're, you were doing something there. Yes. <laughs> so that was like one of the greatest gifts is structure. Give people the gift of, of thinking this through and you know what you're doing here. <laughs> and, and I would say this thirdly, he genuinely loved people. And I, that, uh, for writers, for communicators, for artists, for everybody. A love for people. The craft is wonderful, but without it, all, it has to come from love. If you're trying to prove to people or if you're trying to like, I'll meet people who will be like, I'm, I'm going to really provoke people. It's going to be really controversial. People are going to really have a hard time with it. Get out. Like, whatever. I just don't know if those energies... It may be disruptive, it may be controversial, but let somebody else decide that. You, you, the work that you do, love, love. You're, you're, 
you're trying, you're doing your best to give a gift that might be something for people. And that's, that, that's always been to me the most important thing. Building your own church is every pastor's dream. It's kind of like a chef that's dreaming of owning their own kitchen, and it's quite hard to pull off. When did you first decide to take the leap and launch Mars Hill Bible College? I would sit some Sundays at the church where I, I first started out at. Some Sundays when I wasn't, didn't have any responsibilities, I would sit in the back row and just take it all in. And a lot of people wore suits, which is fine. There was a big choir, a big orchestra. It was a big traditional church. And I would think, I don't know if you need a number of these thing, elements. And I, and, I, and I increasingly felt like this isn't really my world. I don't really relate to this. So what would it look like to speak a language that, that, okay, so what would it look like if it was speaking, I'm having to do a little cross-cultural work here. <laughs> so imagine people who have never set foot in any sort of thing. There's a lot of inside baseball. So could you, could you shape this so that people who have no experience with such things could, could stumble in and be like, oh yeah, I understand what they're talking about here. So yeah, it's, so Chris, my wife, Kristen, and I would often talk, how would we do it? How would we, um, what would it look like? So that, for a couple of years, we had knocked around, that had been a, an ongoing idea. And then it just became time like, oh yeah, it's time to go do this. Let's do this. And honestly, like, how do you do it? A guy told me he had just built this building and it had a big room and he's like, I'll, I'll, I'll let you use that building for a dollar a year. I mean, so, so when you're like, literally we got some friends and well, we should order some chairs. No, I mean, seriously, I remember there were meetings where like, well, okay, if people are going to donate so that we could buy chairs, we need to be a nonprofit. Who, who wants to do that? Okay. I'll do it. Um, okay. So you'll find a lawyer and make it a nonprofit. Okay. Uh, what else do we need? How about, should we do some music? Oh yeah. I, I know a guy I'll call him and see if he'll do some music. Literally, that's what it was like. <laughs> somebody, I remember somebody said, I rented a sign to put out front. And I was like, no, you have to, no, stop. Don't have the sign. People have to like find out about it. You can't, there can't be a sign. So I had like these weird, like <laughs> ideas about, for some reason I was like totally against a sign. It was like a, like a giant art project actually. What do you remember looking back on it now about the very first sermon you gave at your own church? Were you nervous at all? When you're on an airplane and it takes off and there's that moment when the nose lifts off and you're like flattened to your seat. It felt that was an element. I remember the first service was at nine and like at like quarter of nine, someone said, came and got me and like, Rob, you have to come see this. And they took me to this window and they showed me the parking lot. And they were like, there's a massive traffic jam in every direction. People are just pulling over and walking. They're just leaving their car by the side of the road. And they ran out of chairs and people were sitting on the floor. It was chaos. And it was like being strapped to a rocket. It was like the most invigorating adrenaline filled and overwhelming because there was like a thousand details in every direction. <laughs> and so I, we were all just like flying at, at, you're just flying. You're just meetings that would go till 2 AM. Just, we probably need fire insurance. Good point. Who wants to do that? Like, what do we mean by like, who are we? What are we, you know what I mean? <laughs> Yeah, I'm, I'm telling you, it, at the time, I remember thinking, at some point, this isn't sustainable. So at some point, there's going to have to be some pause. And there's going to have to be some time when I process this, because right now it's all happening. You know that you're experiencing something unprecedented. You know that it's taking something out of you you're also like just trying to keep up. It's like all these things at once.
Yeah, your wildest dreams have come true times a hundred. And it's and then all the times when you saw somebody in charge of something and thought, why don't they just do it this way? What's their problem? Suddenly you're in that chair and you're like, oh now I see why they didn't do it that way. It's like more complex. Like if I just do that, then this group of people, you suddenly realize why a lot of the ex-presidents are friends. Because there's a uniqueness to the everything that lands on your desk nobody else could fix so there's a unique there's a there's a unique loneliness to it that you quite quickly are like oh dear everybody i ever criticized sorry i get that this is actually more complicated (laughs) and then i was 28 so you just don't have any idea what you're doing (laughs) when did it first hit you to take your unique talent for putting a hip modern spin on teaching and preaching the bible and put it down on paper and what became your first published book velvet elvis repainting the christian faith well the the basic image was I kept noticing how many people came to our new church and were like, give us the, the thing that isn't changing. What's the, what are you about? What is your foundation in cement? Cause you're like a religious church. So what's the thing that's like never going to change? Like, and I didn't see it like that. I saw it like exploring, like it was, it was dynamic. It was in motion. It was discovery. And I realized that for a number of people, the universe is a static fixed place. And so anything you say about ultimate reality will be like bolted to the floor. (laughs) You know what I mean? Um, As opposed to we're walking a path and we don't know what's up around the bend. And so I remember all of a sudden one day, having this, imagine if somebody had painted a velvet Elvis and I had one, I had, it's up, it's up here in the ceiling. I don't know. It's, let's see if I can see it. It's way up there in the ce- hanging in the ceiling of my back house. Here. <laughs> so I had had this velvet Elvis that my friends and I had bought in college. And I remember thinking if, if the person who had painted that velvet Elvis had announced, there's no more need to paint we'd all laugh. They're like, I did it. I nailed it. We're done. Because we fundamentally, at a deep level with art, acknowledge that you never stop painting. You never stop writing songs. We never stop writing novels. I bet you that same smile on your face you do now when you held that first published copy of the book in your hands. It was awesome. It was totally awesome. I actually, I'm about ready to start a writing course I'm going to be teaching. So I have my book, a stack of my books right here. And the, this is the Velvet Elvis. When we turned in, a friend of mine did the cover and when we turned into the publisher, it was just plain white with a tiny little orange line at the top. And the publisher was like, you can't put out a plain white book. Like you can't, like you have to have the title and your name. And my name was like in tiny light gray. The publisher was like, you just can't do that. And I was like, yeah, 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 you can. It's actually really important. It's not about me. And it's actually really important because it's got a clean let's clean this thing up. Let's make it, let's, cause we were deeply committed to a certain minimalism and design. And so the publisher went along with it to their credit. Yeah. Sex God, exploring the endless connections between sexuality and spirituality was quite a brave limb to go out on as only your second published book, bold subject matter. What first led you down that road? I hadn't seen anybody write about spirituality and sexuality in a way that I, so I hadn't seen that done. And then as a pastor, of course, you sit with people endlessly with all sorts of things people want to talk about. And I just noticed how many times whenever people wanted to talk about relationships or their marriage or their boyfriend or sex or whatever it is they want to talk about in that realm, there was always some other thing. It was a need to be loved. It was, am I good enough? Am I worthy? Do I measure up? Um, They'd have something to prove. So I was always like, wait, wait, wait. I know you're just talking about you and your girlfriend, but you're actually talking about your fear. The now legendary Love Wins landed you on Time Magazine's 100 Most Interesting People of 2011 and struck a universal pop culture chord. Take us back in time to your initial vision for this book when the concept first hit you. Well, it's interesting. No, I've never felt like I was building towards something. It always, 
there was never a plan and there was never like a five year. There was only ever the next thing I had in me to make. And so Jake, that's why it's a really interesting question is what was it all laid out? No. Whenever I tried to like people would ask, what's the, what's the three-year vision here? What's the, I would just go blank. All I knew was there, I have this idea for a tour. I have this idea for a film. I have this idea for a couple of these new sermons. I have a couple, I, I have a couple books that are rattling around. The only way it ever worked for me was what's the next thing. So my book drops like stars, which came out before love wins was about suffering and creativity in the relationship between the two and that was a coffee table book with these in, big thick paper images um so it was just what's the next thing and i kept noticing that as a pastor people always had these questions and how often it was a view of what happens when you die that was animating the question and i noticed a number of people were raised with this idea that you might die and be tortured by God forever in hell. And I just noticed how many horrible things came about in people's lives because of that belief system. Like there's this, these two different groups of humanity and one's going to go to this eternal bliss and the other's going to be in flames with no end. And there were people who talked about the love of God and said, oh, but this God could also maybe torture you forever. Just by the way, it just all seemed like nuts. Um, and so in many ways, the book came out with actually literally the way that Jesus talked about heaven and hell was present states of consciousness. Like we now can shape how the world is. And I just kept noticing how the people who talk the most about hell when you die talk the least about the hells on earth right now. So yeah, at some point it became like, I should write about that. I should show people that when Jesus used the word hell, he was referring to an actual physical place in the city of Jerusalem in the first century. That would be helpful for people to know. I should ask some of the questions about the absurdity of some of these beliefs that people were taught is just the way it is. Yeah, so it gradually began to come together. And it, it, the writing actually came quite quickly. Um, and my wife had said, you know, I think this is really going to, I think this is going to kick up a lot of dust. <laughs> and a couple of friends had read early versions and were like, yeah, this is actually, yeah, this is going to, I had done a sermon about what is the nature of this universe we're living in and, and is revenge, you bomb us, we bomb you, you say this about me, I say something about you, um, that these cycles of violence and revenge are been humanity's fundamental problem. You do this to us, so then we get back at you. Like these endless, it doesn't ever actually work. It's like violent, it's like ping pong. It's just everybody hitting the ball back over the net. But that the only way we're actually transformed is when somebody is like, no, I forgive you. I'm not going to keep the pain in circulation. And the, you do that because you believe that love wins. It's more powerful. Um, so I'd had this, I, I'd had this love, love wins being a way of thinking about your whole life. Like, do I choose to live in love? Is it simply the better way? No matter how tempting it is to extract revenge in some way or another. So I'd had these, and I remember thinking, oh, you should take that love wins. Because when you say it, and when you've talked about it, people seem to grab it and do that heaven and hell stuff that you've sort of, because that's actually about love and love is freedom. Love allows you to see it however you want. Um, oh yeah, okay, all that comes together. There you go, that's what that book, that book is called Love Wins and then it should have an over the top subtitle, something funny like a book about heaven, hell and the fate of every single person. No one knows anything about the fate of every single person. So it became like wink, no, I, very few people got it, but like do some sort of wink in the subtitle that lets people know you're owning up to the ridiculousness of writing about the fate of every single person who's ever lived. Let them know that you're being totally serious and you know what I'm saying? Using this book as an example, what's your advice for aspiring authors regarding subtitles? Uh, it depends on what you're trying to do. Sometimes the subtitle is the title. It all depends on what the person's. I mean, I love titles. Titling is like such joy for me. 
I could talk about titles all day long. I got titles for books that don't exist. I mean, I'm, I like, I never stop. Uh, I, I some once in a while, I'll have a list going of titles for stuff I don't even know exists. Um, I just, yeah, stuff makes makes me laugh. I, and I love doing the Robcast each week because I endlessly am coming up with titles. <laughs> I don't know why, it just makes me laugh. How overwhelming was that spotlight that got shined on you at that time as an author? 100 most influential people in the world. <laughs> You can't say that without laughing. <laughs> I remember the editor called me and he said, I, he said, I just heard from Time Magazine and this is all confidential, but you're about to be named. It's just, it's just a, some list some people in an office came up with. So, so you have to not take it seriously, but then it's also, wow, that's, that's like something. So you're sort of in between, huh, that's actually quite, that wow that's like really cool and oh please it's just a list early on the only path was the path of integrity authenticity be with my family and friends make the next thing um only write speak talk about experiences that you're actually having <laughs> only witness to what's actually working for you. So early on, I noticed that if it was all a performance, if there was any element of you're doing this thing in public, that's not really what your life is like, that that, that, that split was like a psychosis that, I, that would just make a person insane. And I watched people who had like a, a stage switch where they would get up and perform and then they'd walk off stage and be a different person. And I'd watch people in religion. I'd watched pastors who they did this thing that kept all the money coming in and everybody loved. And then they would confess to me what their life was really like. And I just saw that a number of times up close. And I was like, I can't do that. I, I think it'll be me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, it was like a, I had seen some things that I thought better not better just to, to quietly do your work over here. And no one notices than to, to be in that kind of agony. And, and I noticed spiritual leaders would come to me like in secrecy. They'd be like, no one knows that I'm talking to you because I'd lose my job if they even knew I was talking to you, but this is what I'm really going through. And, uh, I would be like, how in the world can a spiritual leader live in a world where they can't be true to who they are? That's, um, that's not going to work long term. So I just, I just couldn't do that. So even the, like, the responsibility or the, even that stuff that, no, the only thing is just to do the next, just to keep going. <laughs> what is the Bible? It's one of my father-in-law's favorite books of yours. What first made you decide from the outset to tackle that expansive topical territory? I had been reading and studying the Bible for years. And at one point I was like, what if I just started typing up riffs on the Bible? Like, cause all, like I just kept noticing people didn't know the context of the Noah and the Ark story or the Abraham stories that like, there's a whole, ancient Near Eastern context that when you hear what these different symbols meant and what was happening at the time, you're like, oh, that totally changes the way the story gets interpreted. So um, I thought I should just type, I should just see how much of it's in my head. I thought, well, what if I just typed up, just pick, pick one of those stories. Oh, okay. How about Jonah and the whale, Jonah and the fish? Oh, well, that's interesting because Nineveh, the city he doesn't want to go to, was the capital of Assyria and the Assyrians had mercilessly bludgeoned his country. So there's no wonder he doesn't want to go get on that boat. These are the, these are the enemy. Um, the crowd probably who heard the story was cheering him on that he didn't want to go get on that boat. Um, so like the social political context of these stories gets really interesting. So I thought, why don't I just type up one of them? Like almost so you're just telling it to a friend. And then I po we posted it on Tumblr. Remember Tumblr? Um, 
And it was something about the act of just riffing on the story, at reading it back through, correcting the spelling, and then posting it that freed something in me. So I started doing these posts. like, And then I thought, what if I just kept doing this for a while? And it, within I don't know how long, there was like 100,000 words on Tumblr. And a publisher said, let's do that. that that's a book. So then it was, okay, there's 100,000 words here. And I hacked it down to 70,000 words. <laughs> I've been there. <laughs> and um, I remember making a thumbnail. There was probably 40 or 50 sections making thumbnails on the, on the screen of the computer. And then just by the hour, just moving, trying to find an order for these. It was almost like trying to find 50 beads on a string and how they would make a necklace yeah that's how it all came together wow and then i loved i had never heard people would always say like do you think the bible is just instead of what is the bible because i noticed how few people could answer that question with any coherence um and that alone it was written by people so all of that sort of lofty religious talk about it comes from god what, what does that even mean it was written by actual people so you probably should know something more about the people who wrote it and where they lived and why they felt the need to write these things that might clear up a lot of confusion this one reminded me of a frank zappa song i assume partially the inspiration for this book came from your own counseling of couples within your church i had come across in um ancient way back jewish commentary there was this word zimzum which it means to it was it was first talked about in the divine contracts within the divine self in order to let other things exist so it is it's the making of space for another one to uh, for another to thrive and my wife Kristen and I I remember saying to her there's this word I think it's such a great word I like saying it zimzum but we, I remember she and I being like, well, that's kind of what, that's what happens in a relationship is you each make space in your life for the, another person to thrive. Um, that's what happens when you fall in love is you're making space within yourself for another. But if someone else is doing that for you, that creates a space between you. And we had never seen somebody talk about a long-term relationship, partnership, marriage, as the creating of a space between you and what happens in that space and how does that space work? And we don't read marriage books. So we were like, marriage books just seem so cheesy. So we were like, could you make a marriage book that's not cheesy? Could we make a marriage book for people who don't read marriage books? <laughs> and so it just became this exercise in, okay, so what is it about this space? What happens in the space? Well, there's something about this space that only belongs to the two of you. So if somebody else is in that space, that's not going to work. Okay. Um, and then we sat side by side for a year and a half. And we also wanted the book to be really short because it had to be something that somebody could hand a partner and they wouldn't be like, I'm not reading the book. Oh yeah, I can read that. And then there are these stick figure drawings. So it has to be super, super accessible and conceptual, but also have these very practical dimensions. So we almost had a list of what it had to be which was like, we didn't even know if we could do it. Hence, a year and a half sitting there every day. Pulled it off. <laughs> and, then, and then there was the, whatever you're going to do, just own it. So uh, just call it a new way of understanding marriage. Don't be like another, just own that you think it's like a whole new way. Just be really bold. <laughs> Don't back down from what you think you're trying to do. Living in the moment is something people often talk about, but it's much trickier to write about. Please tell us how you so effectively pulled it off in this book. I think that more and more people were noticing with social media that they were here but not here. You're sitting in a restaurant across from a friend having lunch, and their phone rings, and instantly are they going to answer it or not? And so you can talk to somebody on the other side of the world. It connects you with people on the other side of the planet, but in the same moment, it's disconnecting you from somebody who's sitting right in front of you. And I noticed that presence being here and nowhere else was about how to, to be present in whatever it is you're here to do. And I kept noticing 
all the ways in which people would get stuck on step three and four instead of being present in step one. Um, and then I noticed that there's the what the person made, but then when I would hear the person talk about how they made it, I always found them telling how they made it as interesting as what they made. Um, so even the conversation you and I are having now about how the books came was always to me the really, really interesting stuff. And I noticed that when I would talk about, I once had this idea, there's this line in the book that keeps coming. I once had an idea. I had all these stories of things I tried to make and what I had learned in the process of making them that was always the stuff that was most rewarding to talk about, which seemed to be the things that people wanted the most. And especially when things didn't go well, people, always, I noticed that people would always be like, tell some more of those stories where everything fell apart. <laughs> and uh, so that became like the framework for the book is I should link all these stories together as this is how to be here in your life and nowhere else, not stuck in the past, not stuck in the future, but right here doing what you're doing. Yeah. Yeah. And so oftentimes you get like that. Oh, okay. I'm gonna try to do that. And then you just start typing and see, see if you can figure it out. You took another bold step with what we talk about when we talk about God, what was initially inspiring you to want to have this particular conversation in a book? Well, I kept noticing people who had been given an, an idea of God that no longer worked. And so they were tossing that out, thinking that was the only way to understand the divine. But then they were left with this need to have language for that of which nothing greater can be conceived. Like, well, then how do you talk about source or the ground of our being or what kind of universe is this? So I remember my editor had said, if you can write about the big, if you can say something new about the big stuff, like God, if you can say something new about God, he's like, that's really, really, really hard to do. But if you can do it, that's pretty significant. So you put something like that in front of me. There's a year and a half. There's, that's, there's two years gone right there because I am going to. Um, and I noticed like there are these words in the book like with or for. Uh, that God is for you. So I tried to, so I just noticed there was a simplicity on the other way, on the other side of complexity, that many people feel life is against them. And that doesn't generally lead to very interesting things. So I was less interested in the concepts and more interested in how does this actually shape your life. And I noticed that when people had a sense that the universe, whatever language you want to use for it, is for you. That's not like cheap motivational speaker slogans. That's, that's actually, it's good to be here. It's good to be you. This is a wonderful experience we're having here. It's got a lot of heartache, a lot of pain, a lot of injustice. Yeah. 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 And that's, that's why we begin with, it's good to be here. Now let's make it better. Let's, I just noticed that there were certain understandings that tilted people in, in new and better directions. So yeah, it's almost like an exercise. And then, um, I mean, the book gets into quantum physics and the, the Isaac Newton, it gets into how the modern reductionist paradigm of science was wonderful for building airplanes and hospitals, but at times it didn't know how to name certain dimensions of the human experience involving soul and heart, spirit. <laughs> So that, that book is like swinging for the fences. That thing's just, you know what I mean? That thing is just like, I'm going, you know, that book is like, it's going to die trying. <laughs> Jesus Wants to Save Christians is a book that you said in shorthand is about human liberation. Please elaborate on that concept as it played out in this book's writing. Oh yeah, and that book was about terrorism, the American empire, the war in Iraq. That was about 9-11. That was about liberation from oppressive empire. I mean, that thing was like, once again, <laughs> but here's where it came from. I just noticed, and I wrote it with my friend Don, how many religious people saw themselves as we're trying to save the world, but they needed help. <laughs> so 
so the title even Jesus wants to save Christians once again we're already winking like these people who are so dead set on saving everybody you know what you probably need saving yourself <laughs> and um so it became there was this way of understanding the story of the Bible as a book about human liberation from oppression. And we, my friend Don and I were, it's like we got, we got like this vision of we should tell that story and follow the thread all the way through and show people what happens when you engage in empire building when your life becomes all about your own accumulation and stockpiling you're missing the real joy of life is when you take whatever you've been given and try to pass it around to help others um so we felt like we could write a book that was very universal and massive that sh that gave a way of understanding political movements but that was also very personal and help people understand the movements in their own lives. So yeah, once again, if you're going to write, man, just go for it. Just go for the biggest thing you can imagine. <laughs> Having your own documentary made about you, The Heretic, must have been a unique experience. How long did you have cameras following you around for that project? The director approached Kristen and I, and he and his producer, they said, we would like to follow you around for a couple of years and see what we capture. And Kristen and I said, and we all agree, and so we agreed okay, but we can't have any editorial anything. We can't have any say. We can't have any role in it. So the only way it works is if you fall around and then you just make whatever you're going to make. That's so cool. I didn't see it until my family and I went to the premiere and sat in the front and watched it in Beverly Hills in a theater full of people. <laughs> so, yeah so i never yeah so i was like if you're gonna do it then just let them make their film like don't <laughs> yeah yeah if you're gonna do it man just go the whole way and see what happens what gives you the greatest joy to see that you've been such a positive influence in your readers lives via it by a books or pastoring or live speaking over the last 30 years love Man, it's the only way. Love. What an. Um, uh, you have to love the work. So the reward is that you wake up and you get to do something, throw yourself into something that matters to you. So you have to surrender the outcomes on the front end. If you're waiting to see how it gets received and then you'll decide whether it was worth it or not, you're already in trouble. So love. You. I mean, I found work I love to do. And my dad used to say to me, the greatest gift you can give yourself is to find work that you love. That's stuck. Yeah, so that, um, that made an impression on me. And, and he was right. Um, so, and when I have veered from that, I always instantly knew it. and was like, whoa that this isn't working <laughs> like that. It's a pretty clean, clear, direct causal relationship. It's, it's never not incredibly meaningful. So that person who's like, I'm so sorry to stop you. I'm so, no, 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 don't, no, don't apologize. It, it means the world. It's amazing. So it fills me with wonder and awe. Um, so the, so, I join the person. If the person is expressing, the person's expressing tremendous gratitude to me, I am feeling the same gratitude. <laughs> um, so we're feeling the same things. So, so that's the, 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 your real question is, how, how does that divide? How does that unite and not separate or divide? And the answer is, I'm feeling what the person's feeling. Well, I'm so grateful I got to do it. And the fact that I met this person and they were grateful, it just creates the opposite of a vicious cycle. It's a different kind of loop. <laughs> and <laughs> then, then I, then you go make the next thing. What can fans expect to get their hands on next? You've been working on during the COVID lockdown. 
Well, my new book, Everything is Spiritual, just came out. So that's... What inspired that one? I'd never gone back and told my uh, a, a number of bits of my story from the beginning. So it's got bits of memoir to it and almost like a my memoir, which is a story of the universe as well. <laughs> it's the most heartfelt how did I get here how did I see the world this way how did this happen <laughs> yeah it was a very very significant book for me it was like very life-changing it was like the book owes me nothing just writing it was like a, an experience I can barely describe so um that one just came out and yeah the next one is there's a couple I'm trying to think like my, my computer here there's there's a couple that are really far along that uh, I don't ever talk about what it is because it's energy I could spend writing it. Favorites time, the most dreaded part of the conversation for many authors I've spoken to. Do any leap right off the top of the list for you, either personally or professionally? Drops like stars and everything is spiritual. Let's close with some advice for those readers who you've inspired over the generations with your own books to maybe want to pick up the pen themselves one day. What would you say to them? Speaking has always been the first voice and writing second, but I'm, I'm finding it only took like 10 books to begin to think about writing, like speaking to find the same sort of open channel vein and just let it come. So it's taken me a while to integrate those two to where I can write. So I, I don't know. I, I, this last book made me, I thought maybe I'm just done with the books. That was, that was a good run. But then the last book I found some new openness of heart. And now the book I'm writing now seems to have the same. So I may have just started writing books. That might've been a great warm up. And now we're really going to do some writing. <laughs> and I think that's important for your viewers you uh, returning to your beginner's mind and the wonder and awe that you get to do this is actually the thing that's behind all of it. So I'm kind of joking about writing 10 books and now I'm learning how to write, but that's actually where all the joy is. Because you've been doing this for a while and then you find a new angle and you find a new playing field and suddenly you're like, wait, is that all, all sorts of new possibilities open up and now you're, you're getting younger as you get older. You're, you're gaining momentum in some sort of strange way. That's what it's been like. Rob Bell, it's been a real privilege. Thank you so much for taking out time to be on About the Authors TV.